resources, including agriculture. Please, Hanan, conclude. There is no time. Okay, how, how, how long do I have? Shall I finish now? Please, it's finished, yeah. unfortunately. Okay, I'll, I, will, I will take only uh, my one minute. During the past decade of prolonged colonization, and here this is my second theme of my speech, which is, which is related to uh, the COVID-19, it has become evident that the, the Israeli military occupation has systematically weakened the ability of the Palestinians to respond to overall health needs, especially the epidemic. Since the year 1948, Israel has systematically depleted medical capabilities and successfully forbidden the import of medical equipment and medication, including treatment of deadly diseases such as cancer, more specifically in besieged Gaza Strip since early 1990s, but strictly since 2007. As a result, Palestinians have become dependent on Israeli military permits to get treatment in Israeli hospitals, which has also not only reduced opportunities for equal treatments and health care for all Palestinians, but it has also exhausted the budget of the people and the Palestinian Authority given the high cost of treatments in Israeli hospitals. During the bombardments in 2008, 2014, 2021, more than 145 hospitals and 80 ambulances, uh, while around 145 medical workers were injured. All these infrastructure you have to conclude was, because I will conclude. Long. I will conclude now. In occupied Palestine, the state's dependence on external funding has robbed of independence and sovereignty of Palestinians and globalization has replaced the value of resistance. For a mass population living under a colonial settler regime, the large amounts of aid comprise catalysts for strengthening dependency among recipients and is considered as a means of liberating the official authorities from their responsibilities. Here I quote uh, Tabar. The conditions of the Oslo uh, accord signed in 1993 and assigning the PA the responsibility of ensuring the protection and security of all people on the land, including settlers and Palestinians, have this. Statement. From an indigenous perspective, the a priority of agricultural and poor areas is to develop and build an economic infrastructure Anana, in there is no time please okay thank you questa sessione contro la guerra per il disarmo against war and disarm for disarmament it's ended, so I'd like to give the floor for the uh, next session. Uh, I'll give the floor to Rafaela for a minute. We are many people. For those who wish to, we shall end this session at 13.40 and we can all go together to Piazza Limonda. I wanted to thank you all for being here. Can't hear anymore. Can't hear. Ah, what the fuck? Scusa. Uh, niente. Ci sono i miei disastri. No, no, no. no. Ecco, aveva, aveva muted il cotto. We're running very late, so I give the floor to Carol Arakete that needs no introduction, really. And I, and I give the floor to the person with Black Lives Matter, Tewi McHarris, USA. This is going to speak from Black Lives Matter. I, I, <clears throat> can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. 
Okay, so I'll, I'll be I'll be brief. Um, first, uh, thank you for just allowing me to join you to address a very important question we all must struggle to answer around the world, which is essentially how do we build not just um, global solidarity, but the type of global sol solidarity that is that it will be able to allow us to advance the particular type the particular alternatives that we need. Um, as was said earlier, an organizer based in the United States who's, who's currently part of a national movement to defend Black lives. Um, we call it the Movement for Black Lives in the United States. Many people call it the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm also someone who identifies as an internationalist, a Black internationalist who understands the pure necessity in not only us having political clarity in terms of the alternatives that our communities need, that the planet needs, but also someone who understands the level of global solidarity in order to advance and build it. And so, so I just, I appreciate being here, to understand that this is a time uh, more than ever where we need to build international solidarity. Obviously, it's very difficult given the pandemic, we all must be virtual, but now more than ever, we actually need to build the level of global bonds um, that are necessary to not just talk about the threat and the, the, the challenges of our times, but also um, what we must do in order to address it. I don't have much time, so I'm not gonna speak too much about this. Many of us understand the level of threat our communities are, are under and face. The threat to the, our communities, but also the threat to the earth, the level of the challenge. Racial capitalism has been a leading uh, source and force in causing profound suffering to our communities, has forced crisis after crisis, only to be rescued and other times emboldened by a neoliberal system and policies. This uh, racial capitalism relationship to racial superi uh, superiority by supremacy and patriarchy, many, many call it hetero cis patriarchy, um, is currently causing so many profound harms to all of us across the world over um, and, and to the planet. Um, and so there's no better understanding of this than witnessing what has happened over the course of this pandemic, where we have witnessed so much death. Here in the United States, we have had hundreds of thousands of people die over the, throughout the, over the course of the world. We've seen over, um, over um, millions, millions, millions of people dying and, and, and then, then and by the, by the economic crisis. crisis. All of this, All of this has happened. Has happened. Not, not only have, not we, only have we witnessed more billionaires, more billionaires um, um, be in the world, be in the world, billionaires, than billionaires, than but also the billionaire, the billionaire crisis as well, by one, wealth by one point two dollars. And so there's no so more there's evidence. No more evidence. That, that is that, that is contrary to also the ways in which capitalism is currently allowed to, 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 to allow more wealth. Um, um, the wealth, the wealth, more wealth accumulation, while so many are. Are, are, are suffering. Now we understand this to be true, but we also have seen the, the result of patriarchal domination on our, on our communities, the harm it causes to so many of marginalized people, but also the cause that, is, that, 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 it, that it has on, on the planet. All of this is happening while we're seeing so much threat threat to our, to, to our communities. Um, and so, yes, we need a global alternative. We need a new just, just global, global economic, economic alternative. alternative. We, we can no longer live under capitalism. capitalism. We, we need to, to pursue ecological feminism. feminism. We need a radically different, different approach, approach how we're, we're in relationship. Not, not just each other and the planet. planet. And we and also we need also to um, witness the, 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 the knowledge and, and, and um, the information of those who have been historically marginalized and harm. And of course, I'm talking about indigenous communities around the world, black communities around the world, Afro indigenous communities around the world, from Colombia to the United States, who have so much lessons about not just how, how to be in relationship to, um, to the land, but also, also around concepts of, of governance. Of course, this is a time when we talk about um, uh, global, uh, global alternatives, we also need to talk about what is the role of, of, of radical democracy. And I'll close by just talking about what is required of the left, which I think is, is the actual question of, of this moment. And, and I, I, I oftentimes we talk about this moment is, is, is it, because it's very challenging. And the truth is, it is. We are witnessing not just because of the, the pandemic, but climate change, the level of threat that we are all in the, in, the, in the planet's all under. But I also must say, this is also a powerful moment in history. And I believe that there's many reasons why. It is very clear that we need a level of ideological clarity across movements around the world, but also that we need to build a global movement, not just a global movement that has ideological clarity, but a global but movement that could be popular, popular enough to hold millions, to hold millions across, across country. country. It can millions ac across language and, I and identity. And so we are, we, are, we are clear. So I believe social movements around the world are clear about that. I believe the way that we, we, we explore building it is that we need to challenge what has historically undermined our 
our ability to forge unity. We also have to challenge how do we build unity in a moment where it's so difficult for us to be in relationship to each other, given the pandemic, given we are virtual. So we must actually really experiment whether using technology or figuring out ways to really address and, and form meaningful relationships. How do we build powerful unity across social movements, across leftists, across um, activists around the world? And then also we need a clear vision. It's no longer enough for us to talk about what we must dismantle, that we must dismantle racial capital capitalism, that we must dismantle patriarchy, that we must dismantle white supremacy. We must articulate a bold, powerful, multi-decade vision that can um, be the vision of all of our social movements around the world. And then we must organize and develop a strategy around that vision in service of that vision and center the lives of, of, of women, uh, queer folks, Black, Indigenous, and oppressed communities around the world. I think that they are many um, um, uh, examples of our history where we have witnessed a global solidarity, but also oh, even more than that, global movement building. building. I, think I think now is the time where we, we must answer, answer this question, question that I often think about, about um, that, that was raised by, by, by friends, friends um, but not, not um, in many, many of his writings, writings and, 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 and it's a quote that I, I, I think about often, often and it says, each, 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 each generation must discover its, 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 its mission um, and relative to what we're And I believe what that, that means for us, for us in this moment, moment what, what is, is our mission? mission? I believe our mission is to articulate a clear vision, to develop a multi-decade strategy, but also to, to, to really struggle over what is the political vehicle that the global left needs in order to engage in the level of struggle that is required in this moment. Thank you. Uh, it's very late at night uh, in the United States. I would like uh, to thank very much our friend. I now give the floor to Carola Rakete that contributed uh, with many men and women reminding us that every single life uh, which has been rescued uh, is important and we must rescue as many lives as possible. Thank you. At this moment of a pandemic, we see clearly exposed how the capitalist system is working. We see rich countries like Germany in particular, but also other countries in the EU or the UK and Norway blocking the TRIPS waiver to make vaccines available across the globe. This is a direct neocolonial practice. Um, in a clear continuation from past exploitation of extractivism and the global south of labor exploitation, uh, causing global injustice, leading to a lot of suffering around the globe and also creating forced migration. In the global north, we have the specific situation that healthcare is available to most people and that companies and enterprises which are responsible for exploitation are located here. We therefore have the unique opportunity but also responsibility to use our privileges that we have as citizens in these countries 
the possibility that we have the health care, that most of us are going to be vaccinated fairly soon, that the companies which are causing destruction are based here, and that we can mobilize and organize against them. So that hopefully as soon as possible, um, health care will be available to everyone, particularly um, the vaccinations and the possibilities for production in all the countries around the globe. It is also important that we connect to global struggles. Uh, we have seen now how easy it is to connect around the globe using the internet, um, doing lots of online conferences, getting to know people even without meeting them. And that when we are planning actions, for example, around the environment, we can focus them on the headquarters of companies in the global north, but they are in direct support of communities on the ground. In the next week, we will have a big um, action day of actually the German anti-coal movement and the Gelände for the first time against a gas terminal in Hamburg, which is directly connected to fracking actions in Argentine and also many other countries around the world. So we will have a first time uh, anti-colonial action day where people will be connected against the gas industry and I think actions like that are incredibly important to highlight how the responsibility for this destruction for these exploitations lies directly in the global north. It is important that we see the connections of the capitalist system as a root cause for the global inequality that we are seeing and that racism is also at the root of that because it has allowed the elites, it has allowed in this class system that we are having that people uh, start othering um, other human beings just for the fact of the color of their skin or perceived cultural differences that people have between each other. So if we really want to change anything, we cannot purely come from a humanitarian perspective. We always will have to be political and we will have to change the system at its root. That also means that when we start again to organize, we have to organize for the roots and not just for the symptoms like ecological problems. We have to organize to build power, to change the social, like to change around the social power structures which are keeping this destruction in place. And that means that not only do we have to mobilize the people who are already concerned, we have to go beyond and to organize people who are not politically active yet. That is a much harder task, it's much more time consuming, but in the long term it will pay out because we will need all people to be politically involved. We will need that all people will have their voices heard in democratic processes and that all their voices will carry the same weight because only once we would reach social equality and uh, just participation of everyone in democratic processes, then we could avoid the harsh Thank you. Next session concerns feminism. We have two activists, Marta Lempart from Poland, spokesperson of women of the movement uh, Women's Strike. It's a very major movement that fought against the political imperialism and the religious realism, the, uh, against the banning of abortion in Poland. Uh, it has become a, a sort of a, a great movement that, that could mobilize all the democratic opposition for rights and democracy in Poland. Um, so I give the floor first to Marta. 
Then we'll have Marcia Andrews from South Africa, an activist and a militant of the peasant from the peasant movement. Hello, can you hear me? There's always this moment that I don't know if if you can hear me or not. Yes, yes, yes. It's okay. Okay, because you, know, you never know with the technology. Thank you so much for first for inviting me here. Uh, it's always nice to see the people, the actual people doing things, uh, because I think that's the that's the connection that we all have that we are people who are doing things and making it happen. Uh, I come always with the same message uh, when the question is, what, what can we do? What can we do to organize better? What can we do to win? What can we do to have the success? Uh, <coughs> sorry. What we can do <clears throat> first, I think, is make all we can to support people who actually want to, to act and to be activists and to do their things. And it sounds really like something trivial, I would say, because of course we are very supportive because we, of course we are all open to anyone who wants to act. About how things should be done, how people should act, how people should react, what tools should we use, what paths should we take. And each time somebody new appears, each time we talk to the people, there's always, always this temptation that we know better, that we can decide what is the speed that we want to take, what are the tools that we want to use, what's the proper language that we want to use. And that's why <clears throat> the feminist movements in Poland, and they were very, very brave and they were struggling and they were fighting against the church suppression, uh, basically when I was a little girl, but they were never massive. And I think, and I can speak, I think I can speak for the feminist organizations, but I, can, I think I can speak for many organizations. There is no measure to how fast we create our own establishments in our movements. There is no measure to how fast we create checklists and list of conditions you have to fulfill to be the good activist, to be the person who acts, to be the proper, properly speaking person, to be the properly looking person, to be the properly acting person. And that's the temptation that we have every day. And I think getting over that and accepting that we are all so different and we don't even have to like each other. And we don't even have to accept that the, the tools, the particular paths that we take for the common goal is something that connects us. At least it works and works for the Polish women's strike. Because what happened in Poland last November was jumping from 150 cities of local groups of Polish women's strike, local initiatives, to, to 600 cities. And it doesn't mean that we've sent some people uh, to the field to bring the enlightenment and to encourage people. It means that we convinced people in Poland, in the post-communist country that loves hierarchy and loves orders, that we are the help desk. The Polish women's strike is the help desk that provides coordination and financing and whatever they might need to organize themselves. No questions asked and no conditions being given. We convinced people for with those four years of our action, because we've been active for, for since 2016, fighting against the abortion ban, we convinced people that they deserve whatever they do when they do it for the right cause, that they deserve the attention, they deserve the support, they deserve the financial support, they deserve the, the media coverage and everything else. with the proper books read and you don't have to look the part and I think this is the source of the success of the Polish women's strike this is the source of the jump from 160 150 cities to 600 cities in Poland last November and the local initiatives and, and the local groups were really connected
responsible for the money being there, for the coordination being there, for the media coverage being there. My dream has come true. Nobody, no, everybody knows now that we will not want anything in return if people want to act for women's rights, for reproductive rights, against violence, for democracy, for the rule of law, to do anti-fascist actions. And I think this is the, the major thing. And this is something that I will always say that this is the, the, the core issue and the core value of the Polish women's strike. And I know that by heart because that's what I was met with. I'm not a proper feminist. I don't know which way I am. I didn't read the books. I don't have the proper education. I don't even look the part. I'm, I'm not wearing the right clothes and I don't, I'm not using the right language. And I'm this really 42 years old woman that works elsewhere. And we're teachers and we're mothers and we're, we're having regular jobs and we don't look the part and we don't act the part. And we had, I guess, to form the Polish Women's Strike because this is the first organization, the first feminist movement and organization that you don't have to pass, to pass the test, the invisible test to get in, to join. So, if we're looking at uh, what can we do to make us organize better, to make it, to make the struggle visible. People actually know what they are doing, people who want to act, people who have initiative and fight the temptation for to put any tests out there to be a good activist, to be a person who acts and a person who changes the world. Because that works for Polish women straight. I don't see any reason that it shouldn't work elsewhere. It worked for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Oh, we wish you successfully in, in your struggle in Poland. Now, from South Africa, Marcia Andrews, she's an activist that works with the peasant women and she works for an organization of men and women. She, she, she's she's a full-fledged activist and a feminist. I have the floor. So as a South African, we normally... today um, it's it's inspirational because in many parts of the world certainly in South Africa there are lots of restrictions that prevent us from organizing in in ways that that we have and I also thank Marta who's spoken before me for some uh, in uh, new ways of thinking and I I think um, one of these years, we must have a dialogue between uh, the Africans uh, and yourself. So it was good to, to hear you. The Rural Women's Assembly is... Uh, ...important part that is linked to what Marta is saying is that we don't claim to be feminists. We claim to fight patriarchy. We claim to fight the systems of oppression because when you're working with hundreds um, and thousands of rural women in remote areas of different ages, the word feminist is not always what people understand. It's through the actions that often um, guides how they fight in an anti-systemic way. So um, I, I want to say that this meeting that you've invited us to speak at, uh, for me, it's a very important moment because 
It comes at a time when uh, us in Southern Africa is undergoing a massive, massive um, upheaval. For the first time in a country like Swaziland, those of you who don't know it, it's probably the last calling um, for democratic elections. And the struggle against the monarch has also been led by women who are demanding their rights to land and many other rights that women have been denied. Also in Mozambique, there is a struggle uh, that's happening and the struggle is also against multinationals who want to capture um, the capture the, the, the north to take over the resources, the gas and the oil and so on. And there's massive uh, conflict. And all of this is also people revolting against some of the elite, the corruption of the elites, etc. I think you may have seen, I can go around the list of countries, but I think you may all have seen that in South Africa, in the last days, we've had a massive um, um, revolts. People call it riots. Uh, 800 supermarkets in two big cities have been completely trashed, destroyed. People have walked off from the supermarkets with baskets of, of food. And of course, not only food, other goods as well, but in the main, Women have joined in these uh, actions. In many ways, we've called this um, food riots and hunger riots that we see exploding in South Africa. But it is not. Uh, I, it's not uh, something that has happened spontaneously in, in one sense. It's today the crisis that we have that has been building up in South Africa and in the region of austerity, massive austerity. Extreme uh, cases where today in, in, in South Africa, unemployment amongst young people, young women, young men is over 50%. So the ground was right, ripe. It's a ticking bomb that 